particularly well. 53 of the 86 primary schools that it was no better than satisfactory. Satisfactory, you'll recall, is the old name for requires improvement, which is a pretty damning criticism. This was noticeably worse than the other subjects which our friends at Ofsted went in and looked at, and they told us that this was a problem two years previously in the previous subject survey report. So what's the problem here? Why is it so hard to assess ICT as was, computing as is? Well, what were your excuses when Ofsted came and asked, you know, why is this going so badly for you? Sorry, Ofsted have never asked, I think, through three inspections, no, no, no. The, um, the, this, this report is done on the basis of a sample of 86 schools, so it's not a huge number, but when they were looking at ICT as was, they weren't impressed by how the schools in that sample were assessing ICT. We assumed that it was a semi-random representative sample. You obviously are assessing computing jolly well in your school. No, I would say we're not. Okay, so what's the, what is the challenge? Why is it difficult to assess computing? Why is it difficult to assess ICT as was? Because <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what what it is, we don't know what the highest, middle, and lowest grade is, or however you're going to. You've got no sort of sense, yeah. set of benchmarks yeah. to work against. And those of you who are old enough to remember the old levels yeah. for ICT, yeah, I mean, no. what on earth does that long, long paragraph of you know fairly bland, non-descriptive text mean? Even in the new curriculum, you know, what is it, something about being able to use variables, use rep sequence selection and repetition? Using sequence covers a multitude of things. Using selection covers a multitude of things. You can sh I can show you a really short scratch program which exhibits sequence selection, repetition and variables. Does that mean I've mastered key stage two of computing? I could probably teach that in like a couple of lessons if so, yeah. Well, I also have the computing side, but it's, it's all about process rather than the end result. You're it? so right! You know, if we want a definition of... I mean, well done. <laughs> Sorry, I said it in a very patronising tone. <laughs> if we want a definition of computational thinking, we have many to choose from, but the one that I think we want to choose from is it's a way of looking at problems where the solution is a process, not an answer. The thinking computation is thinking about how we do it rather than just doing it. Really, other hand, yeah. Oftentimes, it's the driver doesn't actually know where he's going anyway, and then you get the time to go out to look at your subject area, and everybody has not left the house. Then you find that there's nothing to assess because yeah. you can easily say, I don't know anything about IT. I've done it. There's um, some desktop stuff they've done already, and that's it. And the driver's the head. They don't know where they're going. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it could well be the case. Interestingly, the Austin subject survey reports, which I'll admit is not every school in the country, they, they were much more positive about what we were actually doing. The teaching, particularly in primary, was fine in their view. It was the assessment which seemed to them to be a real weak spot. And, you know, I think there is evidence there that you can actually teach well, even if you're not assessing well. So, again, Sort of get rid of what was there and say, come up with your own thing. Ah, uh, well, for two years we, we disapplied the ICT curriculum. We now have a new computing curriculum. And, and, and assessing that is very much, you know, up to schools assessment without levels. We'll come back to the assessment without levels report in like half a dozen slides time. Um, other issues around this, you might be pretty good at telling whether a, whether a program is a good one or not. Yeah, not only does it produce the answer it's supposed to, not only does it exhibit all of the blocks that you'd expect to see, but you can tell that the quality of the code there, the quality of the thinking is broadly speaking sound. Your colleagues who don't have the same subject expertise as you do will really struggle to tell the difference between a good program and one which just about manages to move the cat around the screen in the way that it's supposed to. Think of the simple example of um, you know, drawing a square in Scratch, yeah, if you're looking at that, you might look for repetition, you might look for some degree of abstraction of bringing that out into a block. Your colleagues might be very happy with forward 100, right 90, forward 100, right 90, or forward 100, right 91, right 89 or something, which looks a lot like a square. So there's this sense of the subject knowledge is necessary in order to be able to assess it well. Other issues, um, if you embed computing across the curriculum, very, it's very easy to judge the D&T or the geography <coughs> or the science not always the case that you look at the computing. If you have children working with a partner, 
then how can you tell what one child has learned and what, child, what one child hasn't learned? Um, your thing about process rather solution rather than process is entirely relevant here. Just looking at the code they produce may not give you much insight into the thinking that went into that. And doing screenshot after screenshot after screenshot to show evidence of your thinking is really not the solution we're looking for here, folks. It really isn't. Okay. I think essentially, though, it's the same as any problem with assessment. The learning happens inside the child's head. Changes happen to the brain. There are connections made that weren't there before, or there are connections that are strengthened that were previously weak. When a child learns something, the problem for assessment is you're not allowed to look at that directly. Examining the child's brain requires special training and equipment, and you know, generally the risk assessment is going to be problematic. So all we can do in order to figure out the change that has happened inside the child's head is ask them some questions, which I'll talk more about, or look at the work that they produce. There may be other approaches, but I think most of them boil down to asking a child a question or looking at the thing that they make and trying to work out from that limited evidence the change that has happened inside the child's brain. Have they learned something? Sorry. What you get if you do search for stock image of teacher on Google Images there. That's what we all look like. You know, notice the blackboard and the chalk, you know, that's the way to go, isn't it? <coughs> and I mean, the project-based thing, I've written about this, and I think, you know, it's how we generally come to assessing the creative subjects. We look at the art that they produce, we look at the poems that they write, we look at the scratch programs that they create in our lessons, and we try and work out from that what the child knows, understands, can do, and it's okay, it really is, but it might, I want to, you know, start thinking about this approach as well as that approach. That approach is okay. Our friends at Ofsted, um, as part of the, the criteria for being judged as outstanding, have that you as a teacher should be checking your pupils' understanding systematically and effectively in lessons, offering clearly directed and timely support, not waiting until the end of term and looking at the Scratch project and said, yes, that's very good work. I can see that you understand variables now. Ofsted, for it to be outstanding teaching, expecting a much more tighter feedback loop on, have you understood that idea? Can you do that? And it, it is actually understanding. It's not skills that Ofsted say we should be assessing during lessons. And also, they say that our pupils should be interested in that feedback, and our pupils should be interested in knowing what they can do to improve on their learning. And again, I, I think the implication is that that's on a slightly more tighter loop than looking at an end of term project there. Um, Education Endowment Foundation, who've done, who've read all of the academic studies, so you don't have to, has rate feedback as the most effective intervention strategy. That marking children's work, giving them feedback on their learning, is reasonably cost effective. You might argue with that, it produces eight months of progress compared to not doing that. I'd love to know what the randomized control trial was. Did they really, you know, class into two halves, you should lose these children over here, I'm going to mark your books, you're going to get feedback, you guys, we're going to just see what happens if we don't give you any feedback on your learning. You know, you can understand why there's a difference there. They give advice on what the feedback should be, specific and clear, compare what the learner is doing now with what they've done wrong before, looking at the progress that is made and other things on the list there. You can mark their work. You can look at the folder of the Scratch project. You can also, of course, get the machine to do that for you. Has anybody used Dr. Scratch? Jane has some doubts over Dr. Scratch. Let me show you Dr. Scratch in action. At this point, we hope to slip out of the deck and onto the Dr. Scratch website. So Dr. Scratch will look at a child's Scratch projects, again, so you don't have to. Here's some of the ones I prepared earlier. Let's take my cryptography project here, paste in the URL for that, and ask Dr. Scratch to go off and see how good my computational thinking is in that project. Yes, 16 out of 21, I am a master when it comes to that. Oh dear, not much evidence of parallelism though. Not much evidence of user, well, user interaction to two out of three ain't bad. So not only does it say, you know, you get 16 out of the 21 available points, and I can tweet the result on so to, no, I won't, okay? <laughs> I also get the advice on how I can download a project certificate here, you know, best practice, four sprites, name it, name, dead code, no dead code, 
and nothing about sprite attributes. Let's see what my problem with parallelism here is. So I get the sort of fairly generic feedback. Another way to achieve parallelism, doing several things occur in the program when a user presses a key. How to improve onto two point, uh, how to improve from that, and how to improve still further. So that's sort of fairly general feedback. And this is something you could ask, you know, reasonably literate year fives, year sixes to do with their own projects. And according to Ofsted, a child who's doing that is an indication that you are doing a good job. We also got, I promised you, the assessment about levels thing. So in the Macintosh report on how we move forward in terms of assessment now that all of those national curriculum levels have been removed, one of the things they recommended was that we established a national item bank of assessment questions, which could be used for formative assessment in the classroom so that we could evaluate understanding of a topic and for summative assessment, enabling teachers to create bespoke tests for assessment at the end of a topic or teaching period. Some of you, I'm sure, are using SATS questions from maths, SATS questions for English, to do exactly that within the core of the curriculum, do it for science as well. What you can't yet do is find a good set of questions to assess the unimportant, I mean, the foundation subjects <laughs> in the curriculum, yeah? That's there as a recommendation, and that's one of the things which we're trying to do with Project Quantum, is come up with a bank of questions that you can use in a range of different contexts. Daisy Christodoulou, um, Director of Research for Arc Schools, was part of that assessment without levels commission, and she says, the questions are much more important than the criteria. It's really quite hard to use the criteria as a way of judging where a learner is. We can't do that in a very granular, very detailed way. She argues that really what you want is the good questions. And the evidence that you need that a child has understood that idea is that they can take a test on that. They, you can give them a dozen <laughs> questions, half a dozen questions, on a particular topic. And if they get those right, then isn't that enough? Isn't that the evidence that you'd want, that an inspector might want, that your head teacher might want that the child has understood repetition or the child has understood abstraction or whatever. So assuming you can get good questions, teaching to the test might not, heresy this bit, teaching to the test might not be an entirely bad thing. Teaching a child so in such a way that they can answer the right good questions on a topic might actually be a helpful way of going about this. You're welcome to argue later. Okay. So there are a number of contexts where this sort of approach, a question-based approach to assessment, might be quite useful. Anybody familiar with test-driven development? One nod at the back of the room. Okay, right, two, not, two, two people. Right, so test-driven development, it's an agile, pra agile software development practice. And essentially, you've got to imagine you've written your bit of software, okay? So you've got software that works, that's your minimum viable product, that meets the minimum specification. The client then comes along and says, oh, it would be nice if it could do this as well, yeah? And asks you to implement a new feature at that point. What do you do? The first thing you do is not implement the new feature. The first thing you do is write the test to see if the new feature has been implemented correctly. Writing that test actually does crystallize exactly what it was that the client meant when they said, wouldn't it be nice if it did this, that, the other, whatever. So writing the test is itself a useful process in terms of crystallizing the specification, the requirements. But writing the test then, you throw your software into the test suite, you, you test it according to the, the, the bit of code that you've written, and it should fail at this point. If it passes the test already, then you've already implemented the feature and you need to do no more work on this, okay, job done. You then go off and code your new software, your new feature, and test again, and assuming that you've written the code properly, that it's bug-free, that it does what it's supposed to do, the test passes at st step two there, yeah? It didn't do this, we implemented the feature, now it does this, and here is the evidence to demonstrate that it does this. You could stop at this point, but actually in test-driven development, we then go for a third bit of the loop here where we refactor the code, where we make it you know, possibly a little bit more elegant, where we make it possibly streamline what it does, where we better integrate it into the existing libraries or whatever. Okay, so there's a refactoring process. I hope you see a parallel into our line of work, yeah? Shouldn't we, at the start of a topic, ask children whether they understand this already? Yeah, or actually ask them some questions which tell you whether they understand it already. 
if they do understand it already, then you really don't need to teach it, because they already understand that, yeah? Then teach the thing, <coughs> then test again, and if you've taught well, if they've worked hard, they should pass the test at that point. Yeah, you could, don't you need to use the same questions, you can fix that bit. But isn't that the evidence of a child's progress? Isn't that the evidence we want that learning has occurred? They couldn't do it, I taught it, they can do it. Is it really more complicated than that? I don't think it should be more complicated than that. Don't stop at that point, please don't stop at that point. Better integrate it into their existing mental schema, give them shortcuts, make, make it something which, which sticks in long-term memory rather than they just could do it for the test. Please don't just think, you know, we've taught it once they pass the test, job done. There is a certain refactoring involved. But the whole test of the development thing assumes that you can write a test, assumes that you've got some way of checking whether they can do this or they can't do this. We're here to help you with this. Um, Dylan Williams says, don't just do it at the beginning, the end. Do it during the lesson. It's three minutes, but it's good stuff. And you've got to just love the earring. You really have. When I was teaching regularly, I think the decision I used to make most often every single day was this. Do I need to go over this one more time, or can I move on? How did I make that decision? I would make up a question on the spur of the moment. I would ask the class. Six kids would raise their hands. I'd pick on one of them. They'd give me the correct answer, and I would say, good, and move on assuming the other 29 kids are now okay because they've heard one kid give me the correct answer, or that the other 29 knew it all along. So what we're saying is that actually that's a really bad basis for teachers' decision making. Hearing from one or two kids who volunteered with an answer cannot be a sensible basis for moving forward. So what we're suggesting is that at least once every 20, 30 minutes, if you're gonna make sensible decisions about what to do next, you need to get a response from the whole class and we call these hinge questions. The idea is that we design our lessons with hinges in them. We don't design our lessons like an airport runway where the aim is to start at one end and get as quickly as you can to the other end. At some point, you stop and you check to see whether the students are still with you. And if they are, you do one thing. And if they're not, you do something else. So there's a, a myriad ways you can actually design these questions. What we think is particularly important is this. First of all, it doesn't need to be a big piece of work. We don't want students spending more than a couple of minutes coming up with answers. It's not meant to be a distraction from the lesson. Second, when the students give you their responses, the teacher needs to be able to eyeball the whole class's responses and make a decision about what that means in 30 seconds or less. It's not meant to slow down the lesson. The important thing is you make a quick decision, do I need to go backwards or do I need to go forwards? Or do I need to get kids to talk about their answers in pairs? There's a range of things you can do. The crucial thing about a hinge point question is this. Kids cannot get it right for the wrong reason. If students with the right thinking and students with the wrong thinking give you the same answer, that question is useless because you're having no luck at all in distinguishing between the kids who get it and the kids who don't. So the crucial feature of these hinge point questions, as we call them, is that it's impossible for kids to get it right for the wrong reason. So if they're getting it right, you know they're getting it right for the right reason. And you need to design the question to support that because you cannot you have the time to hear from every single kid their reasons for their choice. Many teachers say to me, I'd get every kid to explain their answer, but they never do because the whole lesson just falls flat by the time you've heard from two or three kids. So the idea behind these hinge point questions is they're quick checks and you can have answers on mini whiteboards, you can use ABCD cards, you can use finger voting, you can use electronic clickers. It doesn't really matter how you do that. The important thing is the teacher can get a quick response from every single kid in two minutes and can make sense of that response in 30 seconds or less and make a decision about what to do next. This way, your teaching becomes more responsive and more engaging. Every student has to generate an answer to the hinge point question, so they're engaged and you're getting high quality information about what to do next as a teacher, and that makes your teaching more responsive to their needs. It's good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, anybody want to make any comments at this point? Is anybody doing this already? Stopping during a lesson, asking a good question, seeing how they're getting on. <laughs> give, me, give me some examples. What you... <coughs> Mini plenary? Yeah. Okay, so give me an example. So we, I, something I do sometimes is I use Google Classroom. So we have a document, so I actually get them to 
uh, here's a question, quick response. It's not quite as quick as this. Yeah. Got everything at once, but I want them to stop and think about something. And it's a question you plan in advance. Not always. So sometimes okay. it's based on one that I'm coming up during the lesson as I'm sort of realising things are going <laughs> in the direction I thought it was going. Yeah. So it's not as perhaps quite as planned, right. but sometimes it is. So. Is anybody using particular technologies to do this? I use fingers. Fingers is fine. Yeah. yeah. Brendan. I discovered I discovered Kahoot during the week. I think that would be. Kahoot works very well with this. Anybody use Plickers yet? Oh. Tell us what Plickers is. Uh, Plickers is uh, an app for the teacher. Every child in the class has a, uh, a QR code. Four QR codes? No, they have one. Okay. They have one. Um, and uh, it's labelled A, B, C, D on each side of the sort of QR code. And depending ah, on which one right. they turn to the top, is their answer. So you as a teacher can just scan with your camera, your clicker's camera, across the classroom, and it will colour them A, B, C, uh, sorry, it will colour them green if they got it right and red if they got it wrong. It will collect their answer and actually store it against the child on the class roster. Wow. Such a clever idea. Wow. Are you using your own? Are you allowed to use your own phone for this? No, it's, uh, we have an eye to Yes, please. Um, with that, because when you use clickers, uh, laminate them, but make sure you use the matte laminating <laughs> patches, not the shiny ones. We've done it with the shiny ones before because of the light bouncing off of it. It didn't register on the camera. And don't. Use the matte ones. And just laminate them, just protects them. And don't let them colour in the squares with the sharpie. Or stick in the back of their books. Yeah. What can arrange? Uh, I don't know, I've only ever used it in a small classroom. I'm in a seven metre classroom. Depends on the resolution of your camera. Jay? Can I ask a question? Does it have to be on an iPhone or an Android phone? Can you just like switch up, switch up your. You'd have to look. Sorry. I think the app is just on the platform. You can't use it with a visualizer, you can't just click and visualize that. You could write something, I'm sure. You know, nice project for year six. I don't think it's, I don't think there's a web-based version yet, but you know, talk to them, suggest the feature. Let me move on because um, I want to show you, give you some other context for using these sorts of questions. Uh, William Law does this. Uh, Greenwich Free School is doing this sort of thing routinely with his students. This sort of hinge point question. These are taken from a CAS community resource. Why is data stored in a computer in binary format? Four possible answers pick the right one. One reason why secondary storage devices needed in most computer systems is four answers pick the right one. At that point, he can tell whether the kids have understood the thing he was teaching or not. Um, over in the States, in first year, or indeed undergraduate computer science education, they're using multiple choice questions in this sort of peer instruction format. So it's as soon as you've got the clicker type device. There, you put the question up on the big screen at the front of the lecture room, ask students to think about their answer to that, respond to that, possibly based on the pre-reading or the pre-video or the whatever. You've got the data, the initial data. Then, assign them to small groups and get them to talk about the answer together. Then, as a group, they agree on the answer and vote again. And you see, of course, that once they've managed to listen to other people's perspective on this and people have persuaded them of this, then you've got, generally you'll see some, an improvement in the scores, have the chance in the plenary to bring those discussions together so that they're learning what the correct answer is and making a reasonably persuasive case. We have evidence that this works, <coughs> that this approach to teaching <coughs> undergraduate computer science education and indeed undergraduate education more generally seems to improve scores when it comes to tests. Not everybody gets it, but generally if they sort of engage in the process, they do, do very well out of something like that. Another in instance of multiple choice questions being used is Project Bebris, at which point I'll hand over to Brendan for a little while. Just quick show of hands, has anyone heard of Bebris before or used it? Okay, so I, I actually am teaching something new. Um, this is the fourth year that Bebris has run. It's the, um, I've been taking part, this is my third year taking part, I'm missing the first year. So, I suppose what you could, for me, it's very useful from a tra from a tracking point of view. Every teacher, I, I teach in the independent schools so in years one to eight. So every pupil in the school takes part, year two right up to year eight. It's called, the official name is the UK Beverage Computational Thinking Challenge. And it's really exactly the types, types of questions the boys are talking about. 
but they're problem solving questions that and in order to solve them you have to use very specific computational thinking skills so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to show you the questions that, that years two and three would have done last year because the, the lovely thing about the site is they leave up when they've given out all the prizes and the certificates etc they leave all the questions up there so you can use them from year to year thereby creating a, a library of resources that can be used every year so uh, let me see that's what the site looks like at the moment because it's ongoing uh, it's live for two weeks because many schools have a week on a week off in their timetable so therefore they have to leave it open for two weeks uh, so let's see now Now, in order to see this week, uh, this year, you have to log in with, your pop, with the username and password, which the teacher sets up for the whole school. It's very easy to set up. It's just an Excel spreadsheet uploaded. So we'll have a look at last year's kits. The way it works is that kits is for years two to three, casters is four to five, junior is uh, six to seven, intermediate year eight, year nine, etc. Just okay, and it actually tells us the answers as well. So we'll know how we're getting on. Now again, yes, this is for years two and three. Um, it's probably a little bit difficult to read from there, but the diagram shows a walking system is, is connected. The system consists of tubes and valves. Open and closed valves are shown in the diagram by the direction of the switch. Water only flows through open valves. The question is, which flower gets water? Now, somebody might be thinking straight away, wait, no, that might, there's an awful lot of reading there to do. The way we get around that is if there are a couple of pupils that have difficulty with reading, then they have the questions read to them. Anyone want to shout the answer? <laughs> Same answer. <coughs> Correct. Now, obviously, that's not how it works on the day of the, on the, day of the test. They just save their answer and move on and they, and they complete it. Uh, at the LIFO ice cream powder, the scoops of ice cream are stacked on your cone in the exact order in which you ask for them. What do you have to say in order to get the ice cream shown in the picture? So top one? No. So, sorry, sorry. This one? Sorry, my fault. There we go. Is this free? All free. All free. And I suppose one excellent thing about it is I've, got, I've now got results for the last two years for every pupil in my school. This year I'll have a third set of results. I'm going to be able to see their progress from year to year to year in what is, I suppose, quite a very broad term is computational thinking. But this is the beautiful thing. Last year, for the first time, they... Um, can you get up from the guys? Um, the, the PDF document that I gave you. Along with the results that they send back to you two weeks later, they send you a whole bunch of certificates that you can give out to people that receive what they call distinction, merit, and also participation. So that's what that, that was our top student last year. And actually, that, that pupil, uh, when they're in the junior level or up, that pupil got to go to Oxford for the national finals. So it's a really nice incentive for the older pupils, if you're especially in secondary or uh, upper primary. And that was a, a really nice achievement for him. But if you showed the, the other PDF, the mm. one is, yeah. that one there, they actually gave a full booklet that broke down the skills being used in every single question. So if a, a pupil is getting all of the questions that are concerned with sequencing right, then you could be quite happy with that. But they might be showing a bit of difficulty with questions that require abstraction skills. So that's one of the, I think that was one of the most beautiful questions that they included, was you had to basically swap A and B. But I suppose in computer science that actually relates to the idea of using a temp folder to move variables around. Mm. But it's just such a simple idea. And you just have to use these buttons to pick up A, move into the middle, go over, pick up B, move over to the other side, and put it back. But like I said, it gives a breakdown. It, that PDF document gives a breakdown of every single skill being used in each question. So as a, as a resource for assessment, it's very, it's very summative assessment, but also very formative assessment that you can actually pinpoint what types of skills they are finding difficulty with. Um, I suppose from my point of view, I've also seen 
the number of pupils participating throughout the UK has increased every year. If it continues to increase, well then, they also give UK averages on the results. So you are going to be able to see your pupils, how they relate to other pupils in the UK, which is, I think it's a very useful piece of information to have. <coughs> so I suppose for my plea, I suppose for every teacher would benefit from having as many pupils as possible taking part, mm. because then their own results reveal more about their own pupils. That's good. Brendan, thank you ever so much. Um, so Beberus is cool, and we've got a lot of the Beberus questions in Project Quantum. So here we go, half an hour into the thing, and eventually it gets around to talking about Project Quantum. So what we're trying to do, this is oh, the great and the good here. So you've got Tim Oates, who's like the nation's expert on assessment advisor to ministers, but let's not hold that against him. We have our own Simon, uh, Professor Simon Payton Jones, FRS, the chair of CAS, and we have Prof Rob Coe up at Centre for Evaluation and Measurement up at University of Durham, who's you know, like the guru in terms of statistical analysis of assessment, all sort of working together on this, let's develop this item bank of questions to assess what's happening in computing. Why computing? Because we don't have historical materials on which we can draw. It's not like maths and English and science where you've got the SATS questions. It's not even like history and geography and all of the other unimportant, I mean, foundation subjects where you have that sort of archive of what we've been doing in the past. This is a new subject, so, you know, there's a chance to do something fresh here. And also there's the feeling that computing teachers can probably use an online system reasonably well. I think the same assumption can be made about this. Some things you need to know, that this is about formative assessment. This is not the end of key stage test as to how much <coughs> computer science, how much computing has the child learnt. We're using an online platform for this, but there's nothing to stop you, of course, downloading these and putting them into a PDF, printing them out, and asking children to do them on paper, apart from the fact that you then have to mark them. Um, this, by doing it online, you get it automatically marked. The child will know straight away at the end of the quiz how well they've done on those particular questions. And remember, children being interested in the feedback on their work is important from our friends at Ofsted's point of view. We want these to be high quality materials, but we're not going about it the same way as an awarding organization, an exam board, or indeed Team Bebras would. What we want for this is to crowdsource it, is to get loads of computing teachers sharing the things that they would routinely use with their class. Many of you said, look, Miles, you're teaching us to suck eggs. We're doing this already. Well done. Glad to hear it. Can we have those questions, please? You know, bring them into quantum and let's share those amongst ourselves. Let's not keep reinventing those particular wheels. And this is about supporting your teaching, not merely assessing what you have learned, so guiding the content. What are the things that children find difficult in computing? We want to be able to answer that question. We want to see what the progress is made year on year, lesson on lesson, across a key stage. Of course we do. And most importantly for me, I think, we want to identify where the misconceptions are. Those of you who are active on the CAS forums see a brilliant thread where we're using some, we we'll start with some of the Bebras, sorry, the quantum content to look at what are the common misconceptions when it comes to computing. Diagnostic Questions is the online platform that we're using for this. You can imagine when you have enough eminent computer scientists and assessment experts sat around a table, they would discuss for a while about how to develop the best platform for this. And we could have spent much of the first year of the project just developing yet another online assessment platform. But we didn't do that. We went with the Diagnostic Questions platform because it's good and it's fit for the purpose we want. And it has some really nice features, as you might see in a moment or two. They have a rule as to what makes a good question for their platform, deeply influenced by Dylan Williams' work on this. This should be something which doesn't take you half an hour to decide whether it's A, B, C, or D. It shouldn't get in the way of your teaching. Something you can put up on the big board at the front of the room and get children to write their answer on the whiteboard in about 30 seconds, maybe three minutes, because computing is a lot harder than maths, as we know. Um, it should be something which is diagnostic where the wrong answer shows you something about what it is that the child doesn't understand, where the right answer is one which either they just happen to guess lucky, there's not much we can do about that with much choice, or they understand the idea. And that itself means that you can really only assess one thing with each question. If you want to do a long, multi-step thing, then break it down into those steps and assess each step separately. <coughs> As it says on the screen, you learn from the incorrect answers. 
I don't care. You can guess the correct responses. Monkeys will get 25% on this. There are some questions where children are scoring significantly worse than monkeys would, but there you go. <laughs> the, the idea is that if you understand the thing, you'll get it right. If you don't understand the thing, then you won't get it right unless you just guess. Um, it should be hots versus lots, higher order thinking skills, rather than what is the definition of algorithm. We want something which reveals whether the child understands it, rather than merely has remembered a definition of it. You might wish to disagree about that. Um, Tim Oates and Rob Cohen, rather dismissive of Bloom's taxonomy, but I know some teachers think that's still very helpful. Think of the top bit of the pyramid, if you'd like to. Let's have a go at some questions here. So what will the open say? I'm sorry this is a bit blurry on screen. Set A to 5, set B to 10, set A to A star B, and say A. I want you to pick one of the four answers. 5, 50, 15, or A star B, A, B, C, or D. In a moment I'm going to do a 3, 2, 1 countdown, and I want you all to call out the letter of your answer. Okay? I'll read the question again. Set A to 5, set B to 10, set A to A star B, say A. 3, 2, 1, B. B. I think I heard lots and lots of Bs. Okay. <laughs> right. That's right. That means very little to me without the um, app running. Absolutely. Do you want to see what children said? Let me show you the answer on the card, okay? I think we're all fairly convinced that the answer was B. Okay. I say I. You think they said A? Why do you think they said A? No, as in say I, sorry, said I. I? <laughs> right. Okay, that's not one of the responses here. Okay, what we have on each question is, let me make this a little bit larger for you. Okay, what we have on each of these questions is this insights tab. And that brings up not only the correct answer, which was B, I think that's what most of you agreed on, but it also allows you to see the explanations children gave for this. So this child, in the Scratch program, it says 10 times 5, which is 50. Five people have liked that as a good response. So, not only, so when you answer the question, we can do this now. Um, let me go back a step. I, we said B, didn't we? Okay. I think this because my friends all agreed on this. Okay. Um, and I click the tick there, and I see that I've got it right. It's coded green here. And then we see the explanations that others gave. We'll get one wrong on the next page. That will damage my user statistics on the site, won't it? Okay. Filter your data brings up the whole list here. So you see here, the correct answer B, actually 72, is done worse than monkeys. 381 children have taken this question. What's well, a quarter of that? That's something around the 95 mark. The monkeys would have scored better than, class, than the children who've answered this question. What have they gone for? They've gone for answer C, 15. And we can drill down into the detail of why do they think it's 15? Because if you add A and B together, it will be C because it says 5, 10. A star B must be 15. I assume they're thinking about the addition thing. There's a plus in there. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, in part, this is just a syntax thing. Yeah, yeah. In part, it could be that the screen is too blurry for them to have been able to tell whether it's a star or a plus. But we have a misconception. Well, we have something which they don't get right. Whether it's technically a misconception is up for discussion. Um, what about the, I mean, the one, the answer I thought was interesting was D. So what answer was the explanations they give for D? Okay, because A is 5, B is 3, when it says A star B, which means multiply over B. Um, it says A to B, and that is what has to say. Okay, because it says say A if you look closer. Okay, <laughs> so you've got, a, you've got all of that lovely information, or data if you wish, there, which is where this gets interesting. Okay, we've got other examples. Um, I want to hand over to Ian at some point, so we won't go through all of this. Sorry. So there's a lot of detail here. What shape will the following sequence of Python instructions draw? Okay, 4 to 100 right, 94 to 100 right, 94 to 100 right, 94 to 100 right, 45, forward 70, right, 90, forward 70. Okay? Again, same game. Work it out in your head. Those of you who wish to type it into a logo or a Python interpreter, you know, type quickly. <laughs> Okay. 
A. It's supposed to give 30 seconds to three minutes. I'm going to force you to pick an answer. Now, dang, not now, when I say oh, three to do the countdown thing. Well, somebody says me. Right, three, two, one. B, C, C. Oh, we've got a B and a C thing going on there. Okay, and if we were doing the peer instruction, this is the point where we talk to our friends and try to convince them what we as a team need to vote for on this. Do you want to see the children's answers? Okay, let's see what they said. Okay, so, um, oh, let's get it wrong. Um, C, I think this because Nick says so. Okay, all right. Okay, and that marks it as wrong. Um, but what did other people say? I oh, no, this it gives you then the correct responses for B. Okay, so in terms of stimulus response reward, it's set telling you what people who voted the right answer, B, and said. And the reasons they gave, yeah. Because first it makes a square, then it goes right 45, forward 70, okay? We can see more explanations for the correct answer. Yes, because what that is what the instructions make the turtle do. That's really helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we've got to like that. Okay. What other people who got it wrong said this sort of thing. Actually, that's a really detailed response. Okay, they thought it through. And, you know, is this a computing thing or is this actually not being sure about rights and lefts, Nick? Where's your problem here? Okay, it's good at computing. Right. It's just, you know, <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, we get to see, you know, you can do the insights thing just as we did on the previous one. I'm not going to do this on all of these. Filter the data, blah, 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 blah. So, actually, you know, you're in good company there, Nick. 51 agreed with you. 61 is still the majority opinion here. So, most, more children have got this right than have picked any of the other responses. But 61 out of 189 is still, you know, there's a lot of people who don't, who couldn't do the code tracing thing. And we know that tracing code, the other thing I'd say about this is reasoning logically. You know, Key Stage 1 National Curriculum used logical reasoning to predict the behavior of simple programs. I'm not saying this is a Key Stage 1 question, but getting children to reason logically about code. I think, you're welcome to disagree, They'll learn more about programming through reading this. No, that's a controversial statement. Reading this is a really powerful way to learn about programming and takes you into thinking territory that just copying it into a Python interpreter and clicking run won't do. Yeah? Being able to put yourself in the place of the turtle was something Papert saw as important all those years ago. Um, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's a good question. Um, uh, thank you. Children just like them because it's their friends. Children don't know who's answering what, um, but they might be able to work it out from what they say. Okay, it's available now. So if you go to diagnostic, www.diagnosticquestions.com, um, it's free for all the features that we're talking about today. There's possibly some sort of premium scheme of work thing, but there's no, you know, that's not happening at the moment. So. Creating questions, setting questions, creating quizzes, assigning children to classes, all of the features you'd want to use, all of that free as of now. We have 2,140 or so computing questions in there already. Most of the ones that are in there have been written with GCSE in mind. We think this is something which would be really nice if it was like the whole of the computing curriculum. So we want more primary questions, please, if you know any sort of you know, great primary school computing teachers who could possibly contribute some questions to this, then you know, please do pass this on. <laughs> um, uh, what was your other question about? The liking system. The liking system, so yeah. Sure, uh, when you go into that, uh, the correct answer, you want the good answers because, yeah. for children. So what we're doing is on the, the, the feature list, so the things which DQ diagnostic questions have got to implement for us, is the author's explanation. So as the person who create, as the teacher who created the question, I should also create a reason why the correct answer is the correct answer. And that one gets precedence. So as the author, not only does the author say this is the right answer, but they also give the detective reason why that's right. And I think that goes to deal with the, the, the you know, <laughs> idiots don't know what an idiot does at that height. Is it possible for the person who lies from teacher to teacher because you don't want to go and take your approach and you, you, you 
Comments. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a moderation thing. So um, when you when you sign up as a teacher, the first few questions you write will not appear on the site until somebody with authority has said that's basically a good. No, it's not a bad question in the sense of the correct answer you give is in fact the correct answer to the question. We kind of want that to be the case. Also, that the questions you create don't include any copyrighted material or rude pictures or rude words or any of that. So there's a there's a pre-moderation until we trust you. Um, in terms of explanations that children give, same thing, there's, there's moderation as to that's, not that it's a good explanation, but it doesn't include any rude words and you know, it doesn't include anything which shouldn't be said inside a public forum. So there's, there's that sort of control. Did you have any control? I don't think that's there at the moment, but that's a really good suggestion. Teachers should be able to moderate their people's yes. comments yes. Yeah, or, or explanations. Love that idea, thank you very much. Sorry, this isn't about the, um, the questions, but the step four when you said about children trying to kids to play groups. Yeah. That to me is a key stage one person, totally flags up all of the walking through rooms. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The part of instruction to find their, yeah. you know, all of that. And that really, for the key stage one amongst us, should sort of show exactly where all of these foundations yeah. would be. And we're used to doing that. Really, it is not that. just a key stage one thing. No, it's we want, you know, when it comes to teaching recursion up at A level, this is crucial. You have to be able to trace through what happens to the variable or the list or the train or whatever it is. But even you're working. Up, no, it's you know, um, have to have a name for it. And I can't, Jane, can you? No. The, the playing turtle thing, the putting yourself oh. in the place of the turtle. There's, a, there's like a four syllable term that Patrick used to describe that. This isn't a new thing that we've only just no. discovered, but it is still a really important. But the key says, what you just wondered where it all starts, you know. Okay. Um, good question. Okay, so you create a, you can just, you know, children can just go on there and create an account and just start answering questions. That's not the way you'd want to use it as a school. So when you create your teacher account, you can create a school or, and you can create classes. And, you know, you can just go straight to layer two and create classes. That produces a class code and children get us, can be assigned to that class. <coughs> we then track the progress of the class across all of the questions that they do. Each question is tagged with a computing concept, so you can see, oh, right, my class has really got very good at selection, lots and lots of greens in that bit of the diagram. When it comes to abstraction, <coughs> only a logic yeah. is scoring very low, which is hardly a surprise given that's a computing concept, so you might not be worried. About that, but it's still, you know, in terms of that Oxford thing about, it's not just about Oxford, it's about education. The children being interested in how well they're doing and wanting to do better, having that information for them as well as for you, that's a good thing. These are the weak bits in my, you know, like lots of scratch cards, but we get to that through questions. Ian? I'll just say, I've been using it for the last, yeah, the last few weeks, and I have an absolute cool number as have my children. I have mainly used for maths. Um, or an important subject. It's, you know, it's, but that's been fantastic because quite often it's been able to show me exactly who knows how to do what it is I'm going to be teaching. And then actually I've moved those kids on to some great depth aspects of it. And they've enjoyed it too. They've absolutely loved it. Computing, I've used all the stuff on the board. It's almost like a mini leader. It's been a really effective way to kind of go, right, let's stop. Let's have a look at what we've been doing. I'm conscious we have 10 minutes left, um, which I was going to give over to Ian. Um, thank you. If I can show you some more questions, or we can have a look at how to write a question. I'm happy to do either, but I don't think there's really time to do both justice now. Hands up, please, for Miles, can you share some more questions, please? Hands up, uh, Miles, can we have a look at how to make a question? Hands up, can we stop now so we can have a look at the tweet? Okay, right, so I'm signed in. Um, you've got to think of a good question. Tell you what, two minutes. Talk to the people near you about, you know, what would be a good question here? What, you know, pick a topic, think of a good question you could ask, and we'll get somebody to come and help write one in two minutes' time. I'm <laughs> 
disastrously wrong. Um, pull your eyes and knees and noses back towards the front, folks. Let's have a go at how to get started with this. Okay, so we've got all of the sort of blurb about how their platform works in here. Let's see what happens with Get Started for Free. I'm a teacher. I'm a student. You, when you get, st <laughs> sorry, it's stating the obvious, but if you're going to start writing quizzes, you need to pick the teacher account at this point, okay? You can get them to sign up for themselves. If you click the I'm a student thing, it says your first name, your last name. It asks you to suggest a username. You might want to do that for children in advance. You obviously have to pick a password in there, which can be problematic for us. There's no SSO with LGFL or anything like that. It wants date of birth. Whether you see that as personal information is down to your school's policy. Um, you'll notice that this is now set as a binary choice. Um, email address isn't required. There's no star against it. You don't have to give an email address. Obviously, they'd like to keep people in touch. Um, teacher account, you've got the same sort of thing going on. I've got an account already. Please, Google, don't have forgotten it. Right, okay. So then, and Simon Page and Jones really was stymied by this. He says, where's it all gone? Where's the menu? But the inventor of Haskell needed to be told you click on the, ha on the hamburger there. Okay, so we've got questions. And that brings up the complete list, when it's working quickly, of the questions we've got in there. We can add some of these quickly to a quiz. And building your own quiz from other people's questions is an easy thing to do. And that's probably the way to start on this, rather than going straight in and writing a question. But creating a question is not a difficult thing. And we learn best through making things for other people. Typically, you've got STEM and then four responses, three of which have to be wrong. Who's got a question which they and their team feel, yeah, this is as good as it's going to get. This is a really good diagnostic question. You're being singled out by your friend there. So, <laughs> What's your question, please? Um, uh, what degrees do you turn to draw a Oh, yes. Or we could give them three programs and say which of these is right, yeah? So which of these, which of these scratch programs would draw an equilateral triangle? Shall we go with that? Okay. So we've got some STEM text up at the top here. It's, I find this... How did you get on with the interface? Okay. I just took me a little while and flicking places and then realising that... Okay. So enter text here is actually means here... <laughs> Which of these programs draw an equilateral, please try and keep your spellings correct, triangle? 
Okay, and then we're going to have the four possible answers. So I've got another text box. This is going to be answer A. And you have to go with A, B, C, and D, I'm afraid, folks. This is going to be response B. Why doesn't it have predefined boxes of A, B, C, and D? Because, yeah. <laughs> 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 it's actually where someone has actually written a question on a piece of paper and written the A, B, C, D. Taken a photo of it, just done that photo into that. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, yeah, it's really yeah, 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 ye
That would be really okay. good. And those of you who are running hubs, do that in yeah. your hub. You know, it's a really nice thing to do. Yeah. I'd be happy, you know, if it's London, I'd be very happy to come and talk, but you know, let me talk before you can Anybody else wants to be a plenary? Good, I'm so sorry to catch you so long. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else see clickers very quickly? I've got two iPads I can show you.